as we get into uh, what we're going to talk about around uh, these ideas within critical theory. Uh, so just as we get ready to kind of go through this, the first thing I want to say is that in no way am I going to be exhaustive in this topic. This is a really, really broad topic that has a lot of nuances within it. Uh, so what our aim is today is to be very general and to kind of give you a big picture idea of what critical theory is and how it works itself out in our society, um, how it works itself out of our culture. Uh, so that's really the way that we want to start. If you look at that first question on your discussion guide, I think that first question will establish a good baseline for every table. Uh, so let's ask that question of one another and spend about a minute, a minute and a half answering this question. Question is, what do you know about critical theory coming into this discussion? Uh, so as we begin this talk, uh, just share at your table for about a minute or so, what do you know about critical theory? So from my just observation of you guys talking at the table, um, it seems like there's some people that feel, you know, like you understand a little bit about critical theory, um, and there's other people that this is like a totally new concept. Uh, so I think that this will be a really helpful discussion for us. I was talking with Daniel yesterday and telling him that this is probably one of the most dense topics that we can look at and cover. Uh, so I just want to say from the onset that um, I'm in no way going to be exhaustive. Um, as Kevin said, you know, this is not going to be a three-hour lecture. It is going to be a little bit different uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a lot of talking. Um, and I'm going to primarily talk from the viewpoint of the people that hold to these beliefs initially. Um, and then as you can see on your uh, little outline there, I want to switch over to talk about the Christian response. Uh, so don't allow my words initially to lead you to believe that I believe the things that I will be saying. Um, I will just try to accurately tell you uh, what people who hold to these things believe uh, when it comes to their thoughts about these areas. So as we look at this topic, uh, one of the most critical things that we have to ask ourselves uh, to lay a good foundation is this question. How do you view the world? When you think about the world, what was that there? Round. Round, there you go, good. Yeah. Spherical, yeah. right, true. Yeah. Evil in most in some ways. Evil in some ways. Okay, some ways, wow, very optimistic. <laughs> very good. Uh, how, do you, how do you interpret reality? You know, like, like what's the lens that you use to interpret what's going on in the world around you? Uh, those are important questions to think about as we look at this. Where does truth come from? You know, who gets to decide what is true? Who gets to decide what is right? Uh, where does that standard fall in our society? And then what do you use to interpret and understand our world? Uh, so beyond just like you as an individual, what do you use to understand all of the people that you come into contact with? All of the contexts in which you interact with people. What do you use whenever you're looking at our world. Uh, those are all big picture questions that you should ask yourselves as you look at these ideas. Because it's through a certain interpretive lens that people have used to be able to formulate these ideas and these principles. And so it's important to think about, you know, what is a person who is not a Christian's worldview? And from that worldview, they actually create these, this belief system, these systems of belief. First question I want us to, to look at as we just kind of delve into this is why does this matter? You know, like, why are we talking about this? Why does this matter? Uh, what's the relevancy of this topic altogether? Critical theory and the ideas that follow critical theory are very prevalent in our society. Uh, so for the last seven years, every year until this year, I taught at the University of Florida's K-12 school. And within that school, all of the English teachers operated from a critical theorist framework. Uh, so the ninth grade English teacher, 10th, 11th, and 12th, uh, they all taught from the viewpoint of a critical theorist. And all of their ideas that they began to teach this next generation revolved around a lot of the practices and principles that they learned whenever they were in college and that they were instilling to the next generation of students. Uh, so all of these ideas are very relevant uh, to our society. Another way that they're relevant is if you're paying attention on any level to politics, um, if you're paying attention on any level to uh, the, the Democratic primary, uh, a lot of the candidates are using ideas that have their foundation in critical theory. You know, so being able to understand uh, their uh, framework for understanding the world and interpreting the world 
is really important because it's, it's the lens that they're using uh, to be able to run this campaign uh, to become the next president of the United States. So all of these ideas are very, very important. Uh, they've left the world of academia and they're entered into mainstream culture, a lot of the views here. Another disclaimer I want to say is that this is a very uh, weighty academic topic. Uh, so I understand that some of these concepts are going to be uh, somewhat difficult to understand. I want to do my best to make them as understandable as, as, um, as, as I can. Uh, but some of these are just, just academic topic areas. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a little bit deep in the first place. Uh, so bear with me. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, once again, I want to give it to you from the viewpoint of a person who believes these things. Uh, so if it sounds like I'm passionate about whatever I'm talking about, I'm not. <laughs> I, I just want you to know uh, what, what, what people who come from this framework think. Uh, so let's talk about critical theory um, from a, a, a big picture perspective. Uh, so critical theory, sometimes it's called cultural Marxism. Uh, what is that? Uh, so this is a social theory oriented towards critiquing and changing society as a whole. Uh, so this theory wants to critique and change society holistically, uh, from, from the top to the bottom. In contrast to traditional theory, where traditional theory only analyzes society, it tells you what's there, critical theory's aim is to change society. Uh, so the entire framework is built around changing society. And that's really important, uh, because these ideas um, have great intentionality behind them. They're not just ideas. Uh, they're ideas to be able to dig beneath the surface of our social lives and to um, upheave them in a lot of ways. Critical theory uh, can be originally traced back to Karl Marx. Uh, so his, uh, his critique of both the economy and society um, eventually led people uh, to have this critical theory type of a framework to use. Uh, so this is why we call it cultural Marxism, because it does go back to the German philosopher Karl Marx, goes all the way back uh, to him. And it focuses itself around power and domination. Uh, so critical theory is all about power and domination. Uh, so what you're going to see is a lot of responses to the perception of power and domination in our society. Uh, this is what they're actually trying to attack. Uh, and so Marxism, uh, just from a big picture standpoint, uh, is an economic and social system uh, based upon political and economic theories of Karl Marx. Um, he used this to be able to explain uh, the ramifications of his economic ideology. And basically what this is, is this idea that um, his, his Marxism is the analysis of social change in Western societies, um, which is based around class struggle. Uh, so Marxism is based around this idea of class struggle and how do we understand Western society from the viewpoint of the struggle between the classes within that society. That's, that's what Marxism is about. And so this cultural Marxism takes it to the next level because it works itself out fully um, on a societal level and not just an economic level like we typically view it through. Uh, typically when you think of Marxism, you probably think of like the Soviet Union, you probably think of like the USSR, you think of communism, you think of the communist system, uh, whereas you know the state owned uh, the entire means of production and the state distributed uh, to the people what they thought that the people needed in a system that was going to be equal for everyone so that there was no class. Um, and so all of those ideas are foundational ideas when it comes to cultural Marxism, what we're looking at now. Uh, basically, Marxism is an economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production and the distribution of goods characterized by um, a, a market that is not free, by a market that is state controlled. Uh, so from Marxism's like, um, entire focus is around the, the, the government, society controlling the state. Um, and so it makes sense that within this framework of critical theory, they want to change society because there's ever going to be a shift in our world that has to come from the top down. So the entire means of thinking has to be controlled by the government, uh, which is why critical theory is so, um, is so pervasive, uh, which is why it is so thorough, because it has to change every aspect of our world. So a critical theory is adequate if it meets three criteria. It has to meet three criteria. It must be explanatory, it must be practical, and it must be normative. Uh, so what does that mean? 
It must explain what is wrong with society, with the current social reality. It must identify the actors that need to change in that society. And it must provide clear norms for criticism and achievable goals for that change in society. That's what makes the theory critical. So what you're going to notice about all the things that we're going to discuss um, in our outline is on every level, these theories affect um, our world in those three ways. It's explanatory, practical, and normative. It's actually going to create social transformation. So I'm very briefly going to talk to you guys about post-colonial criticism. Post-colonial criticism. So I study history at the University of Florida. I love all things social studies. Uh, so I find this to be very fascinating, but I'm not going to bore you. Uh, so as you well know, at a certain point in time in the pretty distant past now, uh, there are these, uh, these empires around the world. Uh, so you know about the British Empire and then the various other European powers uh, that uh, colonized different places around the world, India, South America, the Caribbean islands, several parts of Africa, obviously. Uh, those are the colonial powers. So what post-colonialism teaches is this idea uh, that to be able to understand Western society, you have to understand the foundation of colonialism. You must understand that every part of Western society has been affected by the fact that the people groups around the world were controlled by Europeans. Uh, so you have to look at that uh, framework, the context in which people uh, matured and grew up and the society in which they grew into to be able to understand why society is the way it is. Um, if they weren't colonized, the world would be very different. But we don't live in a world that was uncolonized. We live in a colonized world. Uh, so post-colonial criticism is critiquing the political, economic, historical, and social impact of European colonial rule around the world from the 18th century to the 20th century. Uh, so that's basically what, what post-colonial theory is from a macro level. You have to understand the history of imperialism to be able to understand our world in the Western society. Uh, so if you don't get that, then you don't get why anything is the way that it is. And so what people have done is they have critiqued the world with the understanding that a lot of the reasons why we believe things is because of domination, it's because of power. So all of these things within critical theory have to do with domination and power. It's because of the European uh, countries' domination and power over uh, the various continents that they conquered that we have created the framework for everything. So to be able to change society, you have to understand the, the base for where society has come from. Once you understand the fact that every place around the world was, was colonized, from there you push against that empirical mindset, you push against the empire, you push against uh, that, that colonial mindset to be able to create your new belief system, which is a rejection of the colonizer's cultural ideas, thoughts, and values. So that is post-colonial criticism. Underneath post-colonial criticism flows everything else in this viewpoint. If we're going to push against the colonizer's ideas, against the colonizer's ideology, against their culture and their norms, we have to push against it whole. We have to, to destroy everything. We have to restart from the ground up. And so one of the ways that people begin to um, explain these ideas in society is they begin with uh, critical pedagogy. Uh, so pedagogy is just, um, just the way that you teach. you know. Uh, so what my colleagues did at PK Young, uh, at the school where I worked, is they taught from a critical standpoint. Um, they, were, they were definitely, they will follow in line with critical pedagogy. What is that specifically? Critical ped pedagogy is a teaching approach which attempts to help students question and challenge domination and the beliefs and practices that dominate. So in other words, it's a theory and practice of helping students achieve critical consciousness. Uh, so basically teachers are teaching students to be critical of everything. You know, push back against every power, every structure that you have in your life, completely reject all of those things. Uh, be critical on every single level. This is habits of thought, reading, writing, and speaking, which go beneath the surface meaning, first impressions, dominant myths, official pronouncements, traditional cliches, received wisdom, and mere opinions to understand the deep meaning. 
the root causes, the social context, the ideology and personal consequences of any action, event, object, process, organization, experience, text, subject matter, policy, mass media, or discourse. Push against everything. Criticize everything. Don't accept anything for what it is. Have a critical framework for the way that you approach every aspect of your life. This is what they teach students in high school, particularly in ninth grade. And right now, there's some younger teachers that are coming into the PK Young system that will begin to teach these ideas in seventh grade. So in this tradition, the teacher works to lead students to question ideologies and practices that are considered to be oppressive, including those at school, and encourage liberatory, collective, and individual responses to the actual conditions of their own lives. So the way this practically worked itself out at PK Young is the students decided to completely abolish the dress code. And the administration decided to go with that uh, because they were allowing them to practice their beliefs. You know, they had been teaching the students to be able to criticize and push back against everything. And so the students decided that they didn't want a dress code at all. A dress code is inherently sexist. Um, it's inherently biased against any number of people, any number of groups of people who have different everything. And so how can you standardize that process to apply to all students when all the students are different? And consequently, you should allow them to make their own belief systems around the way that they dress. Uh, so my last year there, they completely abolished the, the dress code. And several students came to school basically wearing like nothing. Um, very, very inappropriate. And the teachers were very frustrated all year long uh, because they created a host of issues. Um, and they went against that this year. Uh, so they decided to, to peel back um, on their ability to allow the students to, to, to push back against the dress code. And they instituted uh, more strict dress code than they ever have as a response of letting the students have freedom. So this is, this is how it works itself out um, in, in everyday life. Uh, the student often begins as a member of a group uh, or a process, uh, such as a member of a religion, national identity, a cultural norm, or expected role, um, that they are critically studying. Uh, so they're within this, like, they have a framework, and then from that framework, they criticize everything around them. Uh, so they have a religion, and they criticize it. They have a, an, an ethnic origin, and they criticize it, and so they push back against everything. Even things that they hold to uh, be true of themselves within their cultural context. Uh, so it's, it's as pervasive as possible. It's as thorough as possible. It engages and hits on every single level of a student's life whenever a teacher teaches them critical pedagogy. So that is what critical pedagogy is. One of the most um, impactful areas of critical theory when it comes to everyday life is critical race theory. Critical race theory. Uh, so transitioning on to critical race theory. Uh, so sometimes I'm going to call critical race theory CRT, CRT. So in case I ever say that, you know what CRT is now, uh, critical race theory. So this is a theory that emphasizes the effects of race on a person's social standing. It arose as a response to the belief that despite segregation ending and affirmative actions installment, racial equity had not been achieved. Racial equality had not been achieved. Uh, so in the 80s, 20 years after segregation ended in America, uh, people who were uh, predominantly initially African American looked at society and said, there is not equality in the society, and so consequently we need to try to understand why that is. You know, there is no official segregation, uh, but there is not equality. So legal scholars, um, originally um, Kim Berle Crenshaw, uh, she originated these ideas. She's the biggest thinker when it comes to critical race theory initially. Uh, she helped to perpetuate critical race theory in the late 1980s in response to the idea that the U.S. had become colorblind um, in those two decades. And so she said this, while race as a notion is a social construction and not rooted in biology, it has had real tangible effects on African Americans and other people of color in terms of economic resources, educational and professional opportunities, and experiences with the legal system. So she did not believe that race was real, but she did believe that the idea of race in American society had consequences, basically. It is also important to note that Crenshaw also coined the phrase intersectionality. Uh, so she was the person that created that phrase, um, intersectionality. I want to talk more about that in a second. 
uh, but we're still going to go into CRT uh, for now. So race is a social construct. These are her ideas. The notion that race is a social construct essentially means that race has no scientific basis or biological reality. Instead, race, as a, uh, race is a way to differentiate human beings in a social concept. It's a product of human thought that is innately hierarchical. Of course, this does not mean that there are no physical or phenotypical differences between people from different regions of the world. However, these differences make up a fraction of our genetic endowment and do not tell us anything about a person's intelligence, behavior, or moral capacity. In other words, there is no behavior or personality that is inherent to white, black, or Asian people. In Critical Race Theory and Introduction, Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanik state, quote, that society frequently chooses to ignore these scientific truths, creates races, and endows them with pseudo-permanent characteristics is of great interest to critical race theory. While, let me let that sink in for a second. While race is a social construct, this does not mean that it hasn't had real tangible effects on people. The impact of the notion, as opposed to the reality, of race is that black, Latino, and indigenous people have for centuries been thought of as less intelligent and rational than white people. Ideas around racial difference were used by Europeans during the colonial period to subjugate non-whites and force them into subservient roles. This socially constructed notion of race, which was used to exercise and reinforce white supremacy, was the backbone of Jim Crow legislation in the South, which relied on the one drop rule in order to separate people by race. Race as an idea continues to have a wide range of effects with respect to educational outcomes, criminal justice, and within other institutions. So what does it mean like when a, when a person who believes in CRT approaches the world, this is the viewpoint that they use to interpret the world, is they begin with the foundation that race is a social construct that has consequences on the way that people have been received and interpreted. Uh, so critical race theory naturally leads into uh, whiteness studies. Uh, so interestingly enough for myself, uh, since I am African American and spend a lot of time with people who are not, uh, one of my friends and I have been like, uh, actually one of the guys I originally d d discipled, uh, he and I have been like working through like what like whiteness studies is for probably the last like year or, or so. So for me personally, this is a very relevant I uh, system of ideas um, as we, we look at this. Um, and he, he, he works um, at the University of Florida Health um, um, company and consequently like his ideas around this are primarily uh, comes from podcasts that he listens to so it was just interesting to him and so we just began to engage and talk about it. Uh, so what is whiteness studies? Well before we talk about what is whiteness studies you have to understand what is whiteness. Let's talk about that. Whiteness within sociology is defined as a set of characteristics and experiences that are attached to the white race and white skin. In the US and European context whiteness marks ones as normal belonging and native, while people in other racial categories are perceived as and treated as unusual, foreign, and exotic. Sociologists believe that what whiteness is and means is directly connected to the construction of people of color as other in society. Because of this, whiteness comes with a wide variety of privileges. Whiteness as normal. The most important and consequential thing that sociologists have discovered about whiteness, having white skin and or being identified as white, is that it is perceived as the normal or default race in the US. Though the nation is racially diverse, and most are aware of that, anyone who is not white is specifically coded through language in a way that marks their race or ethnicity, while white people are not treated in this way. European American or Caucasian American are not common phrases, but African American, Asian American, Indian American, Mexican American, etc., are. It's also common practice among white people to only specifically state the race of a person they come into contact with if that person is not white. Sociologists recognize that the way we speak about people signals that white people are normal Americans, while everyone else is a different kind of American that requires additional explanation. For anyone who is not white, that additional language and what it signifies is often forced upon and expected of them, whereas for white people, because they are seen as the norm, 
Ethnicity is optional. It is something that they can access if they want to and use as a social or cultural capital. But it is not required of a white American, for example, to embrace and identify with her British, Irish, Scottish, French, and Canadian heritage. It is rare that she will be asked to explain where she or her parents are from. In that special way, that really means, what are you? Her whiteness casts her as normal, as expected, and as inherently American. We see the normal nature of whiteness in film and television too, in which most main characters are white. And in the case where a show of film predominantly features actors of color, it is considered a black or Hispanic cultural product. Film and television that primarily features white people is normal film and television that is thought to appeal to the mainstream. Those that feature actors of color in lead roles and casts comprised predominantly of people of color are considered niche works that exist outside of the mainstream. So that's the idea within this flow of thought that whiteness is normal. So now let's talk about whiteness being unmasked. While people of color are marked by their race and ethnicity in deeply meaningful and consequential ways, white people as the perceived norm are unmarked. Uh, in the words of uh, Ruth uh, Frankenberg. <clears throat> by the kinds of language and expectations described above. In fact, whites are considered so void of any ethnic coding that the word ethnic itself has evolved into a description of people of color or elements of their cultures. On the hit Lifetime TV show, Project Runway, uh, Judge uh, Nina regularly uses ethnic to refer to clothing designs and patterns that are associated with the indigenous tribes of Africa and the Americas. Think about it. Your grocery store has an ethnic food aisle, doesn't it? And you know that that is where you go to look for food items associated with Asian, South Asian, Middle Eastern, and Hispanic cultures. All the other food considered normal American food is unmarked, while foods from cultures composed predominantly of people of color are labeled ethnic, and thus marked as different, unusual, exotic. So that's whiteness unmasked. Um, so like, whiteness is everywhere. Whiteness defined by the other. The previous point brings us to another important one about whiteness. It is defined by what it is not, the racially coded other. Sociologists who have studied the historical evolution of contemporary racial categories demonstrate that what white means has always been understood through a process of exclusion or negation. When European colonists described Africans or indigenous Americans as wild, savage, backward, and stupid, they cast themselves in contrast as civilized, rational, advanced, and intelligent. When American slaveholders described their black captives as sexually uninhibited and aggressive, they in contrast built an image of whiteness as pure and chaste. When white people today stereotype black and Latino boys as bad, dangerous kids, they counterpose white kids as well-behaved and respectable. When we describe Latinas as spicy or fiery, we in turn construct white women as tame and even-tempered. As a racial category devoid of any racially or ethnically coded meaning, white is all that it is not. As such, whiteness is something loaded with social, cultural, political, and economic significance. And the last idea when it comes to whiteness studies is uh, white fragility. Um, this, this could be its own discussion in and of itself. Uh, this is primarily what me and my friend have, have talked about. White fragility is the tendency among members of the dominant white cultural group to have a defensive, <clears throat> wounded, angry, or dismissive response to evidence of racism. White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors in turn function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. Uh, so when, when um, from this viewpoint, when white people are confronted with these ideas, with this reality, so to speak, um, it causes them to retreat from this subject area and perpetuate this system of exclusion for those people who live 
within that cultural reality. Uh, so the people who are not a part of the accepted other or the norm have to endure whatever society gives them. But people who are not, they just, this is uncomfortable, I'm leaving, I'm done. So that is white fragility. Um, and there's a really, really long book um, that uh, Robin D'Angelo has, has written about that, that, that talks about that idea. So I think that we should pause there for a second. Um, let me let you process that for a second. Let's take two minutes just to discuss some of those ideas because I can tell by your faces that you're thinking stuff and I want you to, to put that stuff out there to other people so that you can continue to process this. Again, initially, I'm just telling you what these ideas are and then we'll talk about the way that we should respond to these ideas once we get to the end. So let's take two minutes starting now. Uh, so if you want to, um, there, there may be pins at the table so you can just like write on the back of the actual discussion guide if you like, it's totally blank. Uh, so let's, let's move on to buzzwords uh, within CRT. Uh, the biggest buzzword, one that you have to know if you're going to be able to um, intelligently talk about this, is intersectionality. Uh, intersectionality. So what does that mean? Intersectionality refers to the simultaneous experience of categorical and hierarchical classifications, including, but not limited to, race, class, gender, sexuality, and nationality. It also refers to the fact that what is often perceived as disparaging forms of oppression, like racism, classism, sexism, and xenophobia, are actually mutually dependent and intersecting in nature. And together, they compose a unified system of oppression. Thus, the privileges we enjoy and the discrimination we face are a product of our unique positioning in society as determined by these social classifiers. That made perfect sense, right? <laughs> so, so, so basically, it's this idea that, um, you know, like I am uh, a black male who grew up in South Florida in a very urban area that was crime ridden, um, and I'm of a certain age, and I grew up in a particular place when I was in high school. And to understand me, you have to understand all of the ways in which my identity intersects with all the other ways in which my identity uh, connects. So it's like this interconnecting uh, system of identity. So you can't understand me without understanding the intersection of every single one of those things. That's intersectionality. Uh, so for example, uh, as, as I, I just read a second ago, uh, you have to look at me from a racial standpoint, from a class standpoint, uh, you know, so like what type of home that I, I grew up in economically. You have to understand me from a, a gender standpoint. Uh, you have to understand me from a sexuality standpoint. You have to understand me from a nationality standpoint. Uh, so um, not just the fact that I'm like dark in skin, uh, but in my dark in skin because I, my ancestors originally came from Africa directly, um, or did they come from where my ancestors actually did come from, which was uh, the Bahamas. Uh, so on one side of my family, um, my mom's family grew up in Georgia, uh, where they were probably at some point in the, in the uh, past slaves in Georgia, in southern Georgia. And then on the other side of my family, on my dad's side, um, his family came from the Bahamas. Um, and every person of dark skin who lives in the Bahamas originally came from Africa as slaves uh, to work on, in the fields in the Caribbean islands. Um, so to understand me, you have to understand that like, I predominantly think of myself as being a person from a Caribbean island. Uh, my, my dad's heritage is what I predominantly like, like uh, connect to in terms of my cultural identity. Uh, so I, I, I give you the, the lens of me just so it makes more sense. Uh, you have to be able to understand a person um, and all the ways in which their identity intersects with all the other ways of their identity. Uh, that's what intersectionality basically is. Uh, today, intersectionality is a mainstay concept of critical race studies, feminist studies, queer studies, the sociology of globalization, and a critical sociological approach, generally speaking. In addition to race, class, gender, sexuality, and nationality, many of today's sociologists also include categories like age, religion, culture, ethnicity, ability, body type, and even looks in their intersectional approach. 
Uh, so you, you can't even understand a person unless you understand the fact that they are either attractive or they are unattractive because that makes a difference in their uh, lens through which they view society and their ability to participate within society. Um, even something as simple as that is relevant to understanding a person's identity and being able to address that person. Because of its power as an analytic tool, intersectionality is one of the most important and widely used concepts in sociology today. Um, it is very, um, it's, it's increasingly becoming a mainstream word, intersectionality. Um, I've probably read about it just in Christian circles five times in the last like six months. You know, so it's, it's a very relevant idea. Um, one of the ways it, it became relevant is because the Southern Baptist Convention, um, they make resolutions at their annual meeting, and they actually just made a resolution addressing intersectionality at their last meeting. So we actually want to talk about that when we talk about the Christian approach to all of these things. Uh, so that'll be important. Um, it wasn't that bad, Kevin. So you can, I see you getting frustrated. Um, so, so we're going to talk about just the way that, that they address intersectionality, which most of the time the way they address things is wrong. Uh, but in, in this way, I, I, I kind of agree. Uh, so anyhow, that is critical race theory. So that's the big picture of critical race theory. Uh, now let's talk about feminist theory. Feminist theory, so switching gears entirely. Feminist theory, um, thank you women for being here in great numbers. This is, this is helpful. I, I have people who I'm like talking to directly uh, because this is, this is relevant. Because uh, guys at this point would probably just tune me out if there were no women here, so this is perfect. Feminist theory is a major branch of theory within sociology that shifts its assumptions, analytic lens, and topical focus away from the male viewpoint and experience and toward that of women. In doing so, feminist theory shines a light on social problems, trends, and issues that are otherwise overlooked or misidentified by the historically dominant male perspective within social theory. This theory is not as concerned about elevating women above men as much as making women equal in society to men in power structures. Liberal feminists strongly take offense to the idea that women are exclusively to remain in the domestic sphere of the home. They argue for full participation in public life. Notice already I've had to, to talk about this particular type of feminism uh, because feminism is so incredibly uh, specific that I have to break it down into the different types of feminists to be able to help you understand it because I can't generally say this is what they all believe. Common ideas among all feminists. So I will give you some general ideas. Um, then we're gonna break it back down again into specific types. Typically common ideas among all feminists. One, women are oppressed by patriarchy, economically, politically, socially, and psychologically. Patriarchal ideology is the primary means by which women are oppressed. The number one way women are oppressed is because our society is male dominated. That's the biggest idea there. In every domain where patriarchy reigns, woman is other. She is marginalized, defined only by her difference from male norms and values. All of Western Anglo-European civilization is deeply rooted in a patriarchal ideology. For example, in the biblical portrayal of Eve as the origin of sin and death in the world, so I want to stop there because when, when, I, when I read that, um, like it, it frustrated me for a moment because I hate when people misinterpret the Bible. Um, and like initially, the thing that they're like fighting against is something that I would say is not true, biblical. You know, like sin didn't come to the world because of Eve. Um, we can talk more about that in a second. There's this other guy there named Adam, and he did some stuff too. Uh, so. While biology determines our sex, male or female, culture determines our gender, scales of masculine and feminine. All feminist activity, including feminist theory and, liter and literary criticism, has as its ultimate goal to change the world by prompting gender equality. Gender issues play a part in every aspect of human production and experience, including the production and experience of literature 
whether we are consciously aware of these issues or not. So typically, almost all of these streams come from a literary context that works its way out into society. Uh, so that's why my English teachers are beginning these ideas within students, because it's usually, you know, the way that you read and interpret literature helps to form your ideas about society, and so that's, that's why they, they start there. So that's general feminist ideas. Subcategory. I want to give you two. There are many more than two. Um, radical feminism and liberal feminism. Radical feminists tend to be more militant in their approach. Radical means getting to the root than other feminists. A radical feminist aims to dismantle patriarchy rather than making adjustments to the system through legal changes. They identify physical violence as being at the base of patriarchy, but they think that patriarchy can be defeated if women recognize their own value and strength, establish a sisterhood of trust with other women, confront oppression critically, and form female-based separatist networks in the private and public spheres. And what I think is helpful when you look at that is this idea that the only way to affect change in society is to band together with people who are just like you. Like that is the base of every single one of these ideas. That's the base of every ideology that falls underneath critical theory. Um, and hopefully you feel like there's some problems with that, um, even as I, I initially say that. Um, so it's important to understand that. Psychoanalytic feminists attempt to, so this is leaving radical feminism, getting into psychoanalytic feminists. They attempt to explain power relations between men and women by reformulating Freud's theories of human emotions, childhood development, and the workings of the subconscious and unconscious. They believe that conscious calculation cannot fully explain the production and reproduction of patriarchy. There is something so deeply within us that we have to be led by men, um, and it's so deep that like you can't even consciously or unconsciously figure out where it, where it begins and where it ends because it's just it's just there. It just it is. Uh, so that's our uh, psychoanalytic fe feminists who attempt to dismantle that entirely um, from a psychological standpoint. You have to change everything to be able to attack this viewpoint. So that is feminist um, from the big picture standpoint. Now let's switch over to queer theory. Queer theory emerges from gay lesbian studies attention to the social construction of categories of normative and deviant sexual behavior. I want to explain what that means in a second. But while gay and lesbian studies, as the name implies, focus largely on the questions of homosexuality, queer theory expands this realm of investigation. Queer theory looks at and studies and has as a political critique of anything that falls into normative and deviant categories, particularly sexual activities and identities. So queer theory addresses itself with anything that is normative. Uh, so there should be nothing Normative. It's, it's so hard to even like explain this because I'm having to use negatives. I want to use something positive. Um, like there's there is not anything that should be normative. Like everything is subjective. Everything is based upon your experience. Your experience creates all reality. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, so that is that is like where queer theorists comes from. Like it's it's so much deeper than even sex uh, because they would say that like if you just uh, reduce it to sex, that's too reductionistic. It's beyond that. Like, nothing should be normal in society whatsoever. The word queer, as it appears in the dictionary, has a primary meaning of odd, peculiar, out of the ordinary. Thus, queer theory expands the scope of its analysis to all kinds of behaviors, including those which are gender-based, as well as those which involve queer, non-normative forms of sexuality. Queer theory insists that all sexual behaviors all concepts linking sexual behaviors to sexual identities and all categories of normative and deviant sexualities are social constructs, sets of signifiers which create certain types of social meaning. Queer theory follows feminist theory and gay lesbian studies and rejecting the idea that sexuality is an existentialist category or something determined by biology or judged by external standards of morality and truth. 
So you don't determine sexuality based upon your biology, based upon the fact that you biologically have male or female sexual organs. That's not how you determine your sexuality. Um, you also don't determine your sexuality uh, by external standards of morality and truth, like books like the Bible or anything like that. You do not determine sexuality in that way. You purely determine sexuality based upon whatever desires you have. Um, if you desire to have male genitalia, but you think of yourself as a woman, that perfectly falls in line with queer theory. Um, this is where tra transgenderism has really rose in prominence because underneath this area of queer theory um, falls all of these other things that we see worked out in our everyday lives. So for queer theory, sexuality is a complex array of social codes and forces, forms of individual activity and institutional power which interact to shape the ideas of what is normative and what is deviant at any particular moment, uh, and which then operate under a rubric of what is natural, essential, biological, or God-given. There are no such things as those. You do what you think is right. You are who you think you are. It has nothing to do with biology, nothing to do with anatomy. You can change all those things. You can have gender reassignment surgery. Uh, you can take hormone pills, as I had three students do, um, at PK Young, who were born biologically male. In this case, all three of the students that I knew, they were born biologically male, um, and then they took hormone replacement uh, therapy, as well as several other things, and they uh, biologically changed the chemical composition of their bodies so that their bodies began to look more female um, and react in ways that would be stimulated by estrogen. Uh, so this is, this is the outworkings of queer theory. Buzzwords. Cisgender. This is a person whose sense of personal identity and gender corresponds with their birth sex. Uh, so I am cisgender because my birth sex is male and I think of myself as a male. So if you have a corresponding identity with your uh, biology, you are cisgender. Heteronormativity. Heteronormativity implies that there is a hard and fast line between genders. Men are men. Women are women. It's all black and white. There's no gray areas in between. To be heteronormative is to follow the current dominant view of society in exclusive male and female roles that are unchanging. This leads to the conclusion that heterosexuality is therefore the norm, but more importantly, that it is the only norm. It is not just one path an individual might take, but the acceptable one. A queer theorist wants to destroy heteronormativity. We want to destroy that. Heteronormativity creates a cultural bias in favor of opposite sex relationships of a sexual nature and against same sex relationships of a sexual nature. Because the former is viewed as normal and the latter is not, lesbian and gay relationships are subject to a heteronormative bias. Examples of heteronormativity might include the underrepresentation of same sex couples in advertising and entertainment media although this is becoming increasingly rare. Although this is becoming rarer, more rare. More and more television shows, including ABC's long-running Grey's Anatomy, feature homosexual couples. Many national brands have tapped into their homosexual consumer base in their commercials, including DirecTV in its pitch for a Sunday ticket, Taco Bell, Coca-Cola, Starbucks, and Chevrolet. If you look at the way those companies advertise, they advertise in a way that is not heteronormative. Uh, they do not assume that the dominant view of society is strictly in the uh, categorical realms of male and female um, being in opposite sex relationships, but other relationships are um, visible in their displays as well. So that is heteronormativity. Let me give you a couple minutes to process through feminist theory, queer theory, cisgender, heteronormativity. Let's take four. Okay, so as we as we finish up, as we we, we try to land this plane, let's talk about the Christian response. So how should a Christian respond? Number one. As you can see from uh, the outline, 
worldview. Let's talk about worldview. We hold to a biblical worldview as given to us in Scripture. That's the foundation of everything I'm going to say from henceforth. We hold to a biblical worldview as given to us in Scripture. The Bible informs our societal views and our norms and our perspective of humanity. So how do we view people? The Bible tells us how to view one another as people. We don't allow society to tell us how to view the world. That's a very foundational element to every theory I just said, is society doesn't get to tell us how to think about the world. We don't allow society to tell us how we should view humanity or social relationships. Uh, so society should not tell us how to view those things either. Our worldview is biblical. Let's talk about Marxism. The worldview of Marxism is a worldview that understands the basic evil in the world as the oppression of the worker by those who hold capital. And thus, the answer to that is a revolution that would eliminate capitalism, that would eliminate a free market, a free market economy, and would instead put the state in the position of creating an economically just society, and by coercion, and by state ownership, and by confiscation, and the promise that eventually there would be a communist utopia which, of course, never comes. We also understand that Marxism emerged as a, uh, Marxism emerged as a direct response to a refutation of the biblical worldview, a direct response to the doctrine of creation, was replaced with materialism. Original sin was replaced with a Marxist analytical economic oppression, a view of Marxist analytic and a view of Marx these words are really tough. <laughs> <laughs> a view of Marxist analysis of economic oppression. The doctrine of redemption was replaced with the promise of political revolution. And you can go on and on with the ways in which Marxism directly contradicts a biblical worldview and what the Bible says about reality. The Christian eschatology the kingdom of God was replaced with a Marxist utopia of a very perfect communist society. And recently, the chairman of the Southern Baptist Convention Committee uh, that addressed this area of critical race theory and intersectionality has said this. Critical race theory and intersectionality should only be employed as analytical tools subordinate to scripture, not as transcendent ideological frameworks. And I would personally agree with that. You could use these ideas as analytical tools as a Christian, as a way to analyze society, uh, but they're not an ideological framework through which we view the world. Uh, it doesn't shape our worldview. Our worldview is shaped by scripture. When the resolution stated that critical race theory and intersectionality have been appropriated by individuals with worldviews that are contrary to the Christian faith, that reality is that both intersectionality and critical race theory emerge from worldviews and from thinkers who are directly contrary to the Christian faith. The argument of intersectionality is that humanity is marked by oppression that is revealed in a pattern of intersecting social identities. This is a very foundational thought to identity politics. The point of intersectionality is the more complex the intersection, the greater the oppression. In other words, an African-American lesbian is less politically powerful and thus more oppressed than a black male. You can quickly see how all of this has been appropriated by the moral revolution, and it has become an essential tool of the sexual revolutionaries. You also have to understand that critical race theory and intersectionality are now basic fundamentals of thought in higher academia in the United States and in much of Europe. This is the foundation through which people in higher academia in the US and in Europe view the world. So you have to understand this framework to understand like how they view peoples. Both critical race theory and intersectionality are part of a continuing transformative Marxism that is very dominant in higher education and increasingly in policy. As you can see right now in the debates among the candidates for the 2020 presidential nomination, much of the structure of what they're actually arguing about comes from a critical race theory and intersectionality viewpoint. And beyond that, Critical race theory or critical thought is basically fundamental to the political left in the United States. 
Critical race theory and intersectionality is a political extension. That's abundantly clear in the original intent of both intersectionality and critical race theory because they came from legal scholars um, and their purpose was explicitly political. Uh, so the purpose of both of these streams of thought ultimately is to create political upheaval and political change. Uh, so it's important to understand like what the emphasis is on in these ideas. These ideas have, um, have weight within certain realms, primarily within the realm of politics. Ideas, as we know, do have consequences. And one of the most lamentable consequences, but the main consequence of critical race theory and intersectionality is identity politics. And identity politics can only rightly be described as antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to see identity politics as disastrous for the culture and nothing less than devastating for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Almost all of those words came from the president of the Southern uh, Theological Seminary, a uh, guy named Albert Moeller, Dr. Albert Moeller. Uh, those are his ideas when it comes to intersectionality um, and critical race theory. Um, and I would agree with, with, with all those ideas, Russell, what he said I'm just saying. Um, so as a framework to analyze society, fine. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of frameworks I use to, to analyze society. Um, but as the basis of my worldview, definitely not. And I have to understand what the purpose of uh, these ideas is, and that's to um, create political change. Um, and that's to inst instigate identity politics, instigate you determining your political values based upon you putting yourself into a group of people who all think and look and act like you, people who, have, who intersect in all the same ways that you intersect. Um, and we as Christians don't view the world in that way. We don't ascribe to identity politics. Our viewpoints as they come about anything flows out of scripture and the way scripture analyzes and interprets people and what it tells us about people leads to inclusion, leads to unity, leads to harmony, does not lead to the separation of peoples. And what these ideas, I'm, this is me, me talking now. I haven't been talking, it's me for a long time. Um, and, and so what, what we do as people, um, as believers, is we want to unite people as the Bible describes to us in places like Revelation, where it says that every tribe and tongue and nation will all be in the new Jerusalem, will all be in that new heavenly city, will all take part in the kingdom of God. Um, even in the end, God doesn't say that there won't be differences amongst people, but he created those differences so that people be unified in him. Um, and that's a big idea, a big thought that we can walk all the way down that road, but I'll leave it like that and we'll talk more about that later, we can. Um, but there's something beautiful in our differences that reflects some aspect of Jesus. Um, you know, he is, he is a lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation tells us. And he is the Lamb of God who is slain for the foundation of the world. Jesus was incredibly humble um, and a servant to all. And yet he is the Lord of all creation. Uh, he is the God of gods. Um, he is the ultimate one at the same time. Uh, so the complexity of who he is is reflected in the diversity of who we are. So that's a good thing. It's not a, not a bad thing, and we shouldn't create um, sectarian groups. Intersectionality. The problem with intersectionality, big picture standpoint, is that what it does um, is it creates a victimization culture. Um, it creates a culture that says that I'm a victim because of all these intersecting lines of my identity, and that's the ultimate problem with intersectionality is it creates a victimization culture. And you see that, like, I don't have to give you 18 examples of that. Like, you, you live in this culture, so you can understand that we have a victimization culture. That's the ultimate problem with um, intersectionality. So, what should we think about this? Um, we should think that our worldview revolves around our identity as Christians who are ultimately in Christ. As what Peter says to us, as Kevin preached many months ago, Kevin and Daniel preached through uh, First and Second Peter, uh, Peter says this, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are God's people, and our identity comes from our chosenness in him. Um, this chosenness that we actually just talked about very, very recently. So the chosen race is not black 
or white, or red, or yellow, or brown. The chosen race is a new people from all peoples, all the colors and cultures, who are now aliens and strangers among the world. As verse 11 says, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. What gives us our identity is not color or culture, but our chosenness. Christians are not the white race. They are the chosen race. Christians are not the black race. They are the chosen race. We are the black chosen and the white chosen and the yellow chosen and the red chosen. Out from all the races, we have been chosen one at a time, not on the basis of belonging to any group. That's why this amazing phrase is individually crucial for you. You are part of the chosen race because the race that is made up of all individuals who are chosen from all of the races. So your first identity is that God has set his love upon you. That is who you are. Your identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Jesus' saving purpose, what he has done for you in your life. It's not because of your race or any qualifier that God shows you. He just set his love upon us out of his grace. Somebody amen that. <laughs> so that is where our identity comes from. And when you think of race, when we think of race as Christians, like that's what you should think about. We should think about what Peter says. I am part of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy people. That is who I am, part of the human race. Critical theory. Critical theory as a... It functions as a worldview, and it provides us with an overarching meta-narrative that runs from creation to redemption, um, and it gives us a skewed perception of what God has described to us. From a biblical perspective, we are creatures made in God's image who have sinned against him, who need to be rescued through the atoning work of Jesus, and who are called to love both God and our neighbor. Important things to know, all those things I just said about being chosen, I got from John Piper, so you can look it up. Um, almost, almost none of these, these, these thoughts are me. Um, if I'm looking down, it's someone else. If I'm looking up, it's probably me. Um, so, um, I can show you where I got all this, this information from. Um, these respective men and narratives vie for dominance in all areas of our life. Consider, for example, the question of identity. Is our identity primarily defined in terms of our vertical relationship to God, or is it primarily defined in terms of our horizontal power dynamics between groups of people? Ultimately, like, when you think of who you are as a person, does who you are as a person, is your ultimate identity in how this works, or is your ultimate identity in how this works? That is what you should be, be, be thinking about. Uh, when you think about um, critical theory, from a macro perspective. Consider the question of our fundamental problem as humans. Our fundamental problem as humans is sin, in which case we all equally stand condemned before a holy God. Our fundamental problem is not oppression by other people. That is not our fundamental problem. Um, so the points of tension are numerous with critical theory in terms of our values, our ethics, our priorities. And because critical theory understands all relationships in terms of power dynamics, it can't be confined to a single issue such as class or race or gender. It's so comprehensive that it's, it's almost impossible to attack it because it's, it just spreads across everything. Um, and critical theory also claims that members of oppressed groups have special access to truth because of their lived experience. You know, so you can't like really address things with me as a person because you're not a black male who grew up in South Florida who has parents that on one side were slaves in the Caribbean and on the other side their ancestors were slaves in South Georgia. You don't intersect in all those ways. So you can't tell me anything about anything because you're not exactly coming from the place that I am. If you were, I could listen to you because you identify with my politics and we should be in a sectarian group together and then we can affect social change. But since you're not, don't tell me anything about anything. I don't hear what you have to say. I'm pushing against all your thoughts. That's the standpoint that a critical theorist comes from. Um, and that's very problematic because it undermines the function of scripture as the final arbiter of truth accessible to all people regardless of their demographics. Scripture applies to every single person. Scripture applies to every human being. Uh, we know that ultimately we all come from one person. As a Christian, 
as a believer, we all come from one person. And even, even, even evolutionary thought really reinforces so many of these ideas uh, because like if you believe that, like if, if, if you believe that like we came from like this like sludge and you know that we all like evolved at different rates and you know like some people are superior to other groups of people because they evolved at a different rate and thus they're more intelligent or whatever, then a lot of these things make sense to you and you would rightly be rejecting these ideas. Um, you know, so worldview is so critically important in this entire discussion because there's points of tension on so many different levels. Uh, but if you believe that what the Bible says is true, and that God created Adam, and from Adam and Eve came every single person on the planet, your fundamental understanding of human beings is totally different. And the ways in which you should interact with human beings is totally different. Um, and the ways in which we should elevate the value of every single person is totally different. Our solutions to the problems of, of whiteness or whatever are so much superior to a person who ascribes to critical theory. Because we have a viewpoint of humanity that is so much richer than they do. And we have answers to the questions that are so much better than they have. And there should be a way in which we interact with people that elevates people and that doesn't leave them in a place of um, oppression, as they would view it. Um, but we know that the ultimate problem is oppression in itself. So um, that is how we typically should look at critical theory. Um, let's look at women. Um, women are great. So <laughs> the Bible, <laughs> I threw it out there. I waited a second. Thank you for some of this. Awesome. Um, I'm going to get an argument from me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible affirms that men and women are equal in personhood in the eyes of God. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Simple, straightforward, clear. If we study the New Testament, especially the Gospels, the Bible unfolds story after story of Jesus interacting with women. He's a pretty important person in our lives, and the way he interacts with people is valuable. Uh, so there's so many stories in the New Testament of Jesus interacting with women. It starts at the beginning of Jesus' life, when Elizabeth's baby, John, leapt within her womb when Mary, pregnant with Jesus, visited. His life on earth then ends with many women standing witness to his crucifixion, not to mention Mary Magdalene, who was first to find the empty tomb and recognize Jesus' voice after his resurrection. Um, the way that the New Testament portrays women in so many ways is so elevating that I wish I had time to walk you through all of those things between Jesus' birth and his resurrection. I think that the New Testament authors, and God in particular, was very intentional with the way he describes and elevates women, emphasizes women in a culture where if you look at other pieces of literature written at that time, women were not elevated in the same way. So I think there's great significance there. I'll particularly commend to you the book of Luke, uh, because I feel like Luke, out of all the gospel writers, uh, does a really clear, thorough, amazing job at like really elevating women. Throughout his years of ministry on earth, Jesus included women in word and action. He deemed them worthy of concern and healing, even when others didn't. You read that in the Bible multiple times. Other people are like, why her? Why are you talking with her? Why are you over here? Leave this well. Let's go here, Lord. Uh, for example, the disciples admonished the woman who poured perfume on Jesus' feet, but the Lord walked her. These were actions that prepared him for his burial. In Matthew 9, 20 and 22, he healed the woman who bled for many years. She found relief nowhere else, not even with physicians, but with Jesus she found complete healing. He also healed Peter's mother-in-law in Luke 4, 38 through 41, and he healed the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus. Even when situations appeared dire or cloaked with death, he was always concerned about women. We read about women like Deborah, who held and value, who valued and highly respected a uh, position of judge in Israel. She was one of the judges in, in Israel. As a result of her decisions, the Israelites experienced peace for 40 years. We find brave women like Rahab, who landed in the lineage of Jesus, even though uh, her checkered past might have caused many to cast her aside. Um, 
Like when you read things like this is just like I'm I'm like learning out for a second. When you when you read things like genealogies like in the Bible, like there's great like importance there about like the people that scripture includes in those lists of all things. Uh, so like there's there's just so much there. Rahab being included in the lineage of Jesus has significance because there's not a ton of women who are in that list of almost exclusively male figures. Uh, so when it does mention a woman, God's trying to tell you something. Look at it, read it, think about it. <clears throat> also included in the Bible are Hannah, who's probably my favorite woman in the whole Bible. Um, I can talk about Hannah for forever. Hannah, who is a mother who offered her son for the sake of the Almighty. Uh, and Anna also was a great woman, a prophetess, and who was one of the first to see the Messiah. Mary, the young mother who carried the hope of the world in her womb. Rhonda, the servant, who was the first to see Peter after his miraculous release from prison. And Phoebe, a faithful servant in the church. All of these women, women filled different yet very important roles. More information on women, read Judges 4, Joshua 2, Joshua 6, 22-25, 1 Samuel 1 and 2, Luke 2, 36-38, Luke 1, 26-38, John 19, 25 through 27. Acts 12, 13 through 15. Romans 16, verse 1. Women are very important in the Bible. Now let's talk about race. There's one race, the human race. We all have one prime ancestor in Adam. We have many cultural and ethnic differences, but we all have been made in the image of God. Um, I think we used the term earlier, the Imago Dei, uh, to use Latin. Um, that's what Genesis affirms. 1 Peter 2.9, um, which we read before, says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for its own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this is all people in Jesus. Once all of us as different types of people, different groups of people, Paul says, as he did all his missionary journeys, we're not a people. We were not of God. We didn't follow God. We didn't know God. But now we are God's people. We are God's people. We are unified. We are one. I don't need that. Uh, so, like, that's all I have to say about race. <laughs> like, there's, there's one, one race. Um, one, one, one race of people. Homosexuality. The Bible condemns homosexual behavior as sinful. The Bible also affirms the inclusion of those who are formerly in homosexual relationships into the church. For example, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, which says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were once that. You are not now that. You have been redeemed. God's purpose to save includes all people, even homosexual people. So that's all I have to say about homosexuality. I think it's quick. Um, so race was quick, homosexuality was quick. And then one last idea is this idea. This is, this is like so like macro. This is my last thing to say. This is like so, so, so macro. Second Corinthians 10, three. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We as Christians, we don't kill people. Christians don't kill people. We were just talking about the Crusades a second ago. Christians don't kill people. It is explicitly unchristian to kill people. We don't, we don't kill people. Like when people disagree with us, we don't kill them. Um, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. What I do, what Theo does, every single day, every single week, what I strive to do is to make every one of my thoughts obey God, obey scripture, submit to the Bible, submit to what God has said. 
And there are many times where I see something in life and I'm like, oh, I feel like this. And those feelings have to be subordinate to God and to his word. Um, and this looks like it's unjust or whatever, or unfair, or uh, this is like whatever it is. And everything in my life has to, um, has to be brought down and brought captive to obey Christ. Every thought has to be brought captive to obey Christ. Every one of my thoughts has to submit to Scripture. The way I view people has to submit to Scripture. The way I interact with people, the way I share the gospel with people, all of those things has to submit to Scripture. So there's ever a point in my life where I have a viewpoint that deviates from the Word of God. My viewpoint is wrong. God's Word is right. I need to come back into conformity with what God's Word has said. Um, and that's a struggle. That's a struggle for every single person. We all have viewpoints about a thousand different things uh, that may or may not align with Scripture. And we should bring every thought captive to a great Christ. So that's a, that's a meta idea when it comes to these things is to answer the original questions, how do you view the world? How do you interpret reality? Where does truth come from? Who can determine right and wrong? Jesus can. The Bible does. Scripture. That is the place from which we give all of our answers. At this time, we will receive questions. Yeah, Theo, you just proved everything that I believe by saying you're chosen, and there's a whole group of people who are chosen, and then there's a whole group of people who aren't. You just validated everything I believe to be true. How would, how would we answer that? Yeah, absolutely. What I would say in that situation is I would say that our framework is completely different. You know, like, the starting foundation framework is too different. Yeah, it's, it's radically different. You know, like, I tell you that you are chosen because I believe that the Bible tells us that God has decided to save humanity. And so I tell you that so that you will understand that God has sent his son Jesus to purchase your redemption. That's the most important element that I can talk to you about right now. It's the fact that what you ultimately need is Christ. What you ultimately need is Jesus. And I'm going to give you the gospel. And, That's you, the and you really started with the framework. This is what I believe, and this is what the Bible says. And those are your those are your two foundations for everything you're going to say that goes forward from there on. And like you said, and that's the that's the foundational thing. Like I'm not I'm not even going to play in that pool. My pool is completely different. So I'm not, I'm not even going to go down your stream of consciousness because my entire worldview and reality is. Yes, completely separate from, from yours. So I wouldn't I wouldn't get into like like the name calling or like all of those things and trying to make sure that you like use like terms correctly and like all that stuff. Like none of that stuff matters. What we give people is the gospel is Jesus. Um, and when people receive him, everything changes. I think it's important to to remember as well that this has been about setting up the differences, the topic of today's conversation is to understand what turtle theory is and how it applies to these categories and what Christianity would say against them. There could be an entire series of these conversations about how they affirm what Christian, how, how Christianity would affirm these ways of, of viewing the world as an analysis rather than expl an explanation, right? And so when you're talking to somebody who has a, a view of critical race theory or queer theory or uh, heteronormativity, and they bring up what's, what's different between the two, start with, with affirmation. Well, here's what here's what here's where we would agree, right? We would both agree that the world that we're in is broken and disjointed, and there are conflicts along these lines. We see that. Where we differ is on how we understand the origin of the problem and the root of the solution. That's the two. That's where the gospel comes in and is different and sidesteps a lot of the conclusions that are drawn from the various theories that brought up. I would I would also just to answer. Your question, Jeff, about someone else is making sure you're defining. Because uh, Theo said, Theo said the framework thing, but I, I would also think, like in that specific question, redefining the word chosen, right? Because the person likely from your question is coming from a chosen based on economic, racial, or um, cultural stereotypes. We're coming from 
chosen by an all-powerful, all-knowing all creator. Right, we're not talking about, which, oh, I'm chosen because I'm white and grew up in a in Western right. culture. Right. Which may make the conversation even harder, not easier, because now you're saying God chose you. Right. But that's even more than just But then you can also get to the gospel level of God doesn't choose based upon the predetermined factors that we're arguing about here being an issue, right? Because God deconstructs all that. There is right. a few Right. 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 Like in, in, in God's economy, it doesn't work that way. There, as Theo said, right, there's the human race. So I, I just think like even when someone pulls out that word chosen, like if you're going to enter into it, this is apologetics 101. If you're going to enter into an apologetics, this is what it is. You need to be abundantly clear how terms are being defined in a conversation with somebody. Otherwise, it's a waste of your time and theirs. Right? And, and other, you can say things and be agreeing with one another and not know it because people's definitions of terms are different, whether right or wrong, but people's definitions of terms are incorrect and so they don't understand where one other comes from. So. That's, that's so good. And that was the reason why I told you what they believe based upon their words. And then while like, I define the terms based upon the way that they were defined terms, because I didn't want to initially begin by telling you, you know, this is what I think about this. This is the way that I would view this area. Um, because the definition of terms is like essential about like, can be said to any of all this. And and this is this is like all reductionistic, right? So like I just reduced everything down to as simple of terms as I possibly could. I'm trying to give you as like neat package answers as possible. Um, the biggest thing that I'll leave you with is just like just understand the gospel, you know. Like just like understand like how to share that message, and if you can do that, then that's the most critical thing that you can give them. Um, as as they said, you know, like if you can affirm things in people that we would have agreement on, that's wonderful. You know, like that, that gives you a great point of connection. Uh, certainly, like there are things within all of those things that I would say, yeah, you know, that kind of makes sense, and I would I would agree there about this or that, um, because that's kind of a biblical idea to, to some extent. But then there's a hundred other things that I'd be like, nope, against against the gospel. Uh, Anti-Jesus, yep, that is like one of the explicitly against scripture. Uh, so if you can't affirm things, certainly. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you guys for being here. I clap for you. <laughs> A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life.